I'm really happy to be able to share some of the research that my colleague Andy Mankey and I have been working on along with our research assistant, Lauren Truman. Mandy didn't come today. She's on sabbatical, so she very smartly declined coming to campus to sort of work on her publications. So uh, Lauren and I are going to be presenting on Mandy's behalf. And I just want to take a moment to talk a little bit about Lauren's role in the project. So we received a Carla Summer Research Assistantship to be able to hire Lauren to help us. And she was instrumental in helping put together an annotated bibliography that informed our analysis of the results of this study. She also did a lot of really tedious work checking the accuracy of our transcriptions from interviews and classroom observations and course meetings. We had a ton of transcripted data that she looked at. And she also did our intercoder reliability testing. So she was really helpful um, in getting this study um, completed over the summer. She's also helping us right now work on the next phase of our research, which is identifying areas of need for professional development related to multi literacy pedagogy. That's going to be part of a CARLA project that I'll talk about in just a minute. So um, here we go. Okay. So on this slide, you have the goals of the ongoing project that Mandy and I have been doing since um, spring 2017. And these are goals that are shaping our research and that are also going to be informing the foreign language literacies project that Carla is carrying out. The first goal on the slide is kind of our overarching research question that's driven the work that we've been doing for the past year and a half. And this um, research has also been informing ongoing curriculum revision that's been happening in the Spanish language program here. The second two goals are a little bit more practical in nature, um, and those are the ones that are related to our project at CARLA. So over the next four years, we're going to be developing research-informed resources that teachers can use to support their implementation of multiliteracies pedagogy and curriculum development. And I just want to show you, we have a website. Um, so this is which is not showing up, so I won't show it to you. Um, we have the Foreign Language Literacies website that is in under construction. The main thing that's on it right now is a fairly extensive bibliography of resources, multiliteracies resources, research-based resources. But we'll be adding to that. We're going to start adding to it starting next semester. Um, so we're getting that project off the ground. Um, so in terms of our research, um, the first phase of our project was to analyze multiliteracy instructional materials, and we presented on that last year um, in this very room. Um, and we're really interested in knowing how teachers understand and implement those materials in the classroom. So what we're going to be presenting to you today is a study that is part of that um, project. Um, what we're looking at specifically is how teachers talk about multi pedagogy and whether that discourse is reflective of communicative language teaching, which was the predominant approach um, in the program before multi was implemented. Um, we were really interested to see how teachers were sort of um, engaging with the pedagogy and struggling with the pedagogy as the program moved forward. Here we go. Okay, so um, as you, many of you in the audience already know, community to language teaching has been the predominant pedagogy in post-secondary foreign language programs for decades. Yet over the past 10 to 20 years, scholars have been calling for a paradigm shift away from community to language teaching, um, which focuses on oral, functional language use and tends to treat um, textual and cultural content in a superficial way to approaches that recognize the importance of bringing together language and content and to, of increasing the intellectual rigor of lower level language programs. And literacy-based approaches, such as the multiliteracies framework, have been proposed to respond to this call for change. Um, we're not going to go into the details of the two frameworks today. I'm happy to answer any questions about multiliteracies framework at the, during the Q&A. But in a nutshell, communicative language teaching focuses on communicative competence, mostly through development of oral proficiency. Um, and the multiliteracies framework focuses on literacy development through engagement with text and higher order thinking activities. Increasing numbers of post-secondary programs, including ones at the University of Minnesota, are embracing literacy as an overarching goal for curriculum instruction, yet the change is slow. 
like all change. And there's very little known about how teachers understand and implement multilingual pedagogy. So that's really what we're focusing on. So I'm going to turn the presentation over to Lauren, who's going to give you some of the background research that frames our study. <coughs> So, Swaffer has noted that um, the entrenched practices in collegiate foreign language teaching, such as audiolingualism or CLT, have proved difficult to alter. So, there are many reasons for this. Um, they include the difficulty in acquiring theoretical terminology and pedagogical concepts, as well as the need to reconcile instructional practices with previous um, practices or sorry, previous teaching and learning experience. So work with secondary, post-secondary foreign language instructors who are learning about multilingual pedagogy has identified these two factors as relevant to teacher learning. Um, in regards to the first factor, literacy is a complex, multifaceted construct. Uh, Kern, um, for example, acknowledged uh, the abstract nature of literacy when he identified seven principles to guide curriculum instruction and assessment. Um, research on teacher understandings of the multiliteracies framework highlights the complexities of literacies terminology. Research shows that while teachers can acquire macro-level understandings of multiliteracies pedagogy after a one-semester methods course, they lack a micro-level understanding and they struggle to apply their understanding um, in the classroom. The acquisition of the terminology and pedagogical concepts alone, however, does not ensure enactment of the pedagogy and instruction. Grossman, Smagrinsky, and Valencia argued that the extent to which an individual teacher adopts or appropriates pedagogical concepts or tools, quote, depends on the congruence of a teacher's values, prior experiences, and goals with those of more experienced members of the culture. For example, in designing instructional activities, Two of the instructors um, in a study by Jacoy and Allen drew on their previous experience as learners rather than on their formal learning. Specifically, they implemented games, they asked students to perform dialogue, and they used text as model for language forms. These activities drew on their classroom experience as learners where oral and grammatical knowledge were emphasized. Similarly, Minky and Paisani reported that teacher-created text-based instructional materials reflected an unequal distribution of the four um, types of learning activities that are associated with multiliteracies pedagogy. They argue that this imbalance may have resulted from entrenched practices with previous teaching experiences in the field. And we'll turn the time back to Kate to talk more about the presence. So, um, <clears throat> because language plays such an important role in learning new concepts or constructing instructional practice, we wanted to look at the discourse of teachers who were in this program in transition. So um, our participants are three experienced non-tenure track faculty within the, in this program that was transitioning from CLT to multiliteracies pedagogy. And by looking at their discourse, we hope to elucidate the concepts that underlie their understanding and their pedagogical practice and then inform curricular revision and inform creation of materials um, that will help with professional development. So these are the research questions for our study. We wanted to understand the nature of teacher discourse around multiliteracies pedagogy, and we specifically wanted to know whether and how this discourse reflected prevailing ideologies of communicative language teaching. So I'm just going to describe the methodology, and then we'll give a brief overview of the, our main findings of the study. So our um, our research context was the Spanish language program at a large public research university. I can't really hide what the university was, but we have done everything we can to protect the identity of our participants today. Um, so we'll be using the plural personal pronoun to refer to participants so that we don't identify the gender of anybody that was involved in the study. Um, we haven't used names. We've used case one, case two, case three to be um, very um, as I've already mentioned, the program was transitioning from CLT to multiliteracy pedagogy, and we were interested in looking at how teachers were um, implementing and discussing instructor-created multiliteracy lessons, lesson plans. And so we actually ended up observing them teach the same lesson twice over the course of a year and interviewing them about that experience. I'll talk about data sources in just a minute. 
Um, our participants were non-tenure track faculty. They were all teaching the same course. They all had 10 or more years of experience teaching at the post-secondary level. And they had um, engaged in similar professional development activities around the universities. Um, we collected a lot of data for this project. The, what we're reporting today is a subset of that data, but we did a pre and post study questionnaire to get an understanding of teachers' understanding of multi literacies pedagogy and some of their background. Um, we observed classes, we collected teaching artifacts, um, we did post observation interviews with each participant, we did two class observations and two sets of interviews, therefore. We attended all of the professional development meetings that took place over the last year. So we went to the uh, Welcome Week meetings as well as each of the meetings that took place during the semester. Um, and we also, of course, took researcher notes. So today we're going to be reporting on data from the questionnaires, from the post-observation interviews, and from the six course meetings, not on the, uh, the Welcome Week stuff, but just the course meetings. Um, for data analysis, we, um, we did a three-stage analysis of the data. So once we identified segments in which teachers talked about multiliteracies pedagogy, we then did multi-cycle descriptive coding to identify themes in the data. We wanted to understand the kinds of things that they talked about when they discussed multiliteracies pedagogy. So these included things like student thinking, communication opportunities, instructional design, implementation, and so on. Then once we had done that initial descriptive coding, we did concept coding. So we, um, we wanted to categorize the data according to theoretical concepts from multiliteracies, pedagogy, and from communicative language teaching so that we could characterize the discourse of the teachers around multiliteracies pedagogy. And you can see in the table on the slide the concepts that we used to do this part of the analysis. We also had subconcepts for each of the main concepts. Um, we don't include them in the table, just for space. And then the final stage of coding was to, of analysis, was try to triangulate these coded data segments from observations and course meetings with teachers' personal histories as reported in the questionnaires. Um, because we wanted to understand whether um, the challenges related to conceptual understanding and previous learning experiences had any impact on the way that teachers talked about the um, okay, so I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Lauren, who is going to talk about our overall findings and then specific findings related to one of the three participants. So we'll start with the punchline, the overall. Um, so on this continuum, case one, whose discourse most closely reflected CLT is on one end. Case three, whose discourse most closely reflected multi-literacy is on the other, and case two is inching away from CLT towards multi-literacy concepts. Um, so in the next three slides, we'll provide an overview of the findings. Like Kate said, we will um, focusing on the concepts that characterize CLT and multi-literacy, as well as um, exemplary quotes and information about the learning histories. So as we saw in the previous slide, um, case one's Discourse most closely reflects CLT concepts, particularly language functions, comprehensible input, effect, and real-world language use. Um, in some instances, case one's discourse was reflective of multiliteracy concepts, such as an analyzing the social sociocultural dimension of literacy and text, but their discussion of these ideas was grounded in CLT. The first quote in the middle column of the slide um, illustrates this finding and underscores case one's emphasis on language forms and functions over textual analysis. Um, they say we can use texts that are more closely related to the grammar and kind of start from that instead of starting more abstractly. The second quote shows case one's hesitance to engage students in higher order thinking activities such as textual analysis. They said, I've always been kind of scared to do strong analysis sorts of activities with intermediate students because I've always been scared I'm setting them up to fail. So this hesitance was related to case one's insistence that text, and more broadly input, be comprehensible to learners and be reflective of their current proficiency level. If texts aren't comprehensible, case one felt that students would become discouraged or set up to fail, as this quote exemplifies. Um, although case one had participated in a range of professional development experiences around multiliteracies, their background in CLT and their self-reported eclectic approach likely influenced their discourse. Um, experience 
experiences such as CLT, um, ACLT oriented methods course were a foundation, foundational part of Peace One's learning history and were incongruent with our understandings of multi-literacy's pedagogy. And this may have hindered Case One's ability to appropriate complex, complex literacy concepts and apply them in instruction. Yeah, and I should add, just related to the last thing on the um, personal history, is that Case One also would try to map multiliteracies concepts onto their understanding of community language teaching. Say, oh, well, it's the same thing. Um, and so it really, the, those CLT concepts really did permeate everything that Case One talked about in relation to um, the new framework. For Case Two, as you can see from the first column on the slide, um, Case Two's discourse around the literacy pedagogy was strongly rooted in communicative language teaching concepts like proficiency, oral communication, um, creating a student-focused classroom, um, allowing students to uh, express their personal opinions, and so on. Um, case Two identified two sets of goals for language teaching and learning. Instrumental goals, such as proficiency development and real-world communication, and intellectual goals, such as textual interpretation and the study of literary cultural content. The first goal was strongly associated with communicative language teaching, and the second with multiliteracies concepts. And the two goals were often positioned in opposition to one another. Case two tended to prioritize instrumental goals for low-level language courses, and they used CLT concepts to ground their understanding of multiliteracies pedagogy. The two quotes in the second column of the slide illustrate these findings. In general, Case 2 found that multiliteracies pedagogy provided insufficient attention to language forms and insufficient opportunities for interpersonal communication, which are the bedrock of lower level language instruction. This finding is illustrated in the first quote when Case 2 says, our goal for students is to be a successful communicator in Spanish at the intermediate mid-level, in addition to being globally competent and all of these other things. This quote also shows Case 2's emphasis on oral communication and proficiency development. The second quote reflects the finding that Case 2 associated the multiliteracies framework with intellectual goals for language learning, and that these goals were sometimes in opposition with the more instrumental goals of learning and practicing grammar and vocabulary through communicative language teaching. In the final course meeting of the semester, Case 2 said, I think multiliteracies pushes students to think in a more abstract way almost theoretical about language, rather than just focused on the grammar form or the new vocabulary form. Case 2's personal history teaching with communicative language teaching likely influenced their discourse around multiliteracies pedagogy. Case 2 referenced successes teaching with CLT on multiple occasions, and at times questioned whether their perceptions of multiliteracies pedagogy were influenced by their CLT background. Case 2's values, experiences, and goals related to communicative language teaching were incongruent with multiliteracies pedagogy, and this was bolstered by the distinction that Case 2 made between instrumental and intellectual learning goals in language courses. In contrast to the first two participants, Case 3's discourse was framed by multiliteracies concepts, and they used CLT concepts to scaffold thinking about this new framework. CLT thus served as a point of comparison and even a point of entree um, with this new framework. Um, and Case 3 emphasized the intellectual challenge of analyzing text as the thing that differentiated communicative language teaching from multiliteracy approaches. For instance, when discussing instruction of language forms using a multiliteracy approach, Case 3 recognized the importance of drawing students' attention to textual features that help them understand how meaning is designed. For instance, in the third course meeting, case three said, like, how can you get the most out of a text and not be so, oh, we have to cover this, but more like, you know, what does this offer, this being the text? Here we see that case three sought to differentiate CLT and multiliteracies pedagogy based on the way language forms are taught in each approach. The second quote on the slide highlights a multiliteracies concept that dominated Case 3's discourse, developing students' higher order thinking abilities. In the first interview, Case 3 said, the main thing that I wanted was for them to talk and to be critical about the painting. Developing students' higher order thinking abilities is thus achieved through critical thinking and communication about text, um, in this case, a painting or an image. 
For case three, this kind of thinking provides students the opportunity to examine textual features and connect them to the world around them. As I already mentioned, case three's discourse um, regularly differentiated the two pedagogical approaches and set CLT principles and practices in opposition to the multiliteracy framework. These oppositions may have resulted from case three's personal history, which included extensive lived experiences with communicative language teaching, and these were in contrast to the primarily formal learning experiences case three had had with multiliteracy pedagogy. In addition to participating in multiple professional development activities related to multiliteracy pedagogy, case three was also eager to apply the framework correctly and get feedback on her teaching from the researchers during the interviews case three often said, did I do it right? How can I get better at this? Um, case three's formal learning experiences therefore may have facilitated congruence with her lived experiences regarding community language teaching. So we said at the beginning when we showed you that multiliteracy is continuum that the, the participants in our study talked about multiliteracy as pedagogy differently. Yet there are three themes that were common or three commonalities across all of the data that we looked at. The first is related to communicative language teaching concepts. So all three cases emphasize the concepts of student affect and the instruction and practice of language forms. Um, for cases one, or two, one and two, these were salient features of their classrooms. It was really important to them to create a, a, um, a positive environment for their students. Um, and these concepts were incompatible for them with multiliteracy pedagogy, particularly the teaching of language forms. So it was incompatible with multiliteracy pedagogy. For case three, cultivating positive student affect was a way to facilitate implementation of multiliteracy pedagogy. So again, it illustrates case three's use of communicative language teaching to sort of scaffold their understanding and implementation of multiliteracy pedagogy. The second commonality across the three participants was related to the multiliteracy concept of text. Um, all three cases emphasized um, this concept, and it was most salient when they discussed the definition of text and the purpose of text in the classroom. And this is unsurprising, given the role of text in the multiliteracy framework. And for our participants, texts were at the heart of multiliteracy pedagogy, and that was the main thing that differentiated it from communicative language teaching for everybody involved. Um, the final commonality across the three participants was the theme of scaffolding. They all talked about scaffolding instructional activities, scaffolding their classrooms, but talked about this theme differently. So for case one, scaffolding was equivalent to teacher questioning and explanation, and it was through questioning and explanation that texts became comprehensible to learners. So it wasn't the learners that were gaining access to the text necessarily, but rather the teacher that was providing it through scaffolded activities. For case two, scaffolding was something that facilitated language practice and student-driven textual interpretation. Um, and this was connected to case two's emphasis on creating a student-focused classroom and on prioritizing communication, especially oral communication. For case three, scaffolding provided a bridge between communicative language teaching and multiliteracy pedagogy. And it was scaffolding was the thing that led to higher order thinking on the part of students. So those were very different ways of looking at scaffolding across the three participants. Um, based on our findings, we identified three uh, main implications. So the first one is the importance of attending to teachers' personal histories and everyday experiences when introducing a new pedagogical framework. Um, it's important for teachers to be aware of their underlying beliefs and their own entrenched practices so that they can kind of get them out in the open and put them into dialogue with approach. Um, we, it's also important for them to be able to put those everyday experiences into dialogue with their more formal learning experiences related to the new um, pedagogy. And um, we also found, because some of the participants struggled so much to appropriate multiliteracies, concepts that were very similar to the concepts in communicative language teaching, we think it's important to help teachers make connections between their knowledge of communicative language teaching and how it relates to salient comments, uh, concepts in multiliteracy pedagogy. For instance, case one talked a lot about comprehensibility. 
Um, and so it would be interesting to have a discussion with this individual about what it means to be comprehensible from a multiliteracy perspective so that that concept is meaningful in that framework too. The second implication that we identified is the oft-repeated need for sustained, articulated teacher professional development across their learning experiences and post-secondary concepts. Um, typically, the model is to have welcome week or orientation workshops, and then a methods class, and then that's it. Um, there may be some follow-up at the beginning of this, every academic year, but there's often very little sustained professional development over the course of an academic year. So it's important for teachers to have multiple and varied experiences around multiliteracy pedagogy to um, bolster their conceptual development and their ability to um, apply those concepts to the classroom and to be able to make theory practice connections. And then the third item implication that we identified is the importance of aligning instruction and assessment. And this was a theme that came up a lot in our data, that there was a mismatch between what was being expected <coughs> in terms of instruction and what was actually happening on classroom assessments. So this points to the need for backward design planning um, when creating curricula um, that will hopefully lead to deeper conceptual understanding and greater teacher buy-in to this new approach um, if everything's lined up rather than, than disparate. And again, this just came up over and over again, and I know that the Spanish program is working on that. Um, but it was very telling in data um, when we had the results. So that's it for us. We have a lot of time for questions and comments. I just want to thank um, Carla for providing the funding to be able to have Lauren help us this summer on this project. We also want to thank um, the participants in the Spanish language program. We had uh, three freshman researchers who did our initial transcription uh, last year. They really learned a lot about the tedious work of transcription. <laughs> so Millie, <coughs> Sienna Gambino, and Jacqueline Levine. And then we also want to thank, again, Lauren and Russ Simonson, who was our GA last, um, last summer, who did some of the initial transcriptions for this project. So we're ready for your questions. I, I had a follow-up to what you said about how people with the communicative say, oh, I've always been doing that, yeah. but, but now I should just define it as multi-literacy. Can you give us a specific example of that? Um, of someone who says, oh, I've always done that, but it's not exactly the same thing? I'm trying, there was an example that really stood out um, with one of the interviews that we did. And I'm trying to remember the specifics of it. Um, I think it was, the, the example that I'm thinking of is equating the use of authentic materials mm -hmm. with the, the way that texts are true. Basically, because I use authentic materials, I'm doing multiliteracies. Right. Okay. But in reality, the approach was not the same because the multiliteracy approach goes deeper into the text. Yeah. And that was your summer workshop when you showed us what to do with authentic text. You can't just say I'm using authentic text, you have to know. Or just do true false questions about right. the text and then move on. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. In um, case number one, there was a quote that had to do with um, feeling afraid. Yeah. And I was wondering if uh, emotion um, was a thread through any of the other data. Yeah, uh, it, it was. Because I feel like teacher learning is often really, in, you know, involved in um, some emotional work. Yes. And actually, with this particular case, we pulled this quote out, but there was later on in the same interview, case one said, I, but I'm trying more. I feel more confident doing it now. Um, so there was a sense that there was less fear about that. And I think I had mentioned case three, who wanted our approval, who was so worried about not doing it the right way. And then case two kept saying, Oh, well, maybe it's just my understanding of communicative language teaching. Maybe I'm not getting it right. Maybe I don't really know what I'm talking about. So there was some insecurity around the approach. So yeah, I would say that emotion was a common thread that came through. Yeah. Um, and when we look at um, conceptual development, and if we look at, well, that's our next phase, I think that might come out. 
Well, and the, a lot of the teachers are also talking about student affect, right? Yes. Which yes. also is like another um, side of that. Yeah, and teacher affect was one of the themes and in our coding that we, that we identified. Yeah. What kind of resistance was there among instructors to this move? Um, I can't really speak to that because I um, am not a member of the program. Um, in our data collection, we did not experience a lot of resistance. I think people were more concerned about the quality of their teaching than about pushing back. Okay. Um, and then there was this whole issue of assessment that was really gnawing at people, rightly so, um, and I think that that was a hindrance to wholeheartedly adopting things. Yeah. You and Mandy conducted the interviews, right? Yes. So I wonder if you had thoughts, have thoughts about how it would be differently if somebody who wasn't so closely associated with this push did it, like, yeah, so Did you we see any evidence that that was effective. We talked about this. We so the way we structured it was I actually conducted the interviews and Mandy was present um, and asked follow up questions from time to time and took notes. But it, it, there was no way to eliminate the bias of that. I mean, you've got you know somebody who offered a book on the framework and then you've got the course <laughs> supervisor in the room. So yeah, it it. Um, it, it could have really influenced, especially this emotional part of it. Um, and we should probably address that when we write about it. Yeah. But I'm not sure that we would have been able to get as rich responses from people if, had, if the interviewer had been somebody who wasn't familiar with the program. Um, All right, I was wondering if you and Mandy discussed came up with any ideas for dealing with the assessment piece, since you said that was such a hindrance to fully adopting yeah. the multi-literacies pedagogy. Yeah, we haven't talked about it very much. I really, um, it's important to me to try to be hands-off with the programmatic side of it, because I'm not a member of the program, and I'm not a course supervisor, and I don't want to influence the way that Mandy and the coordinators are doing their job. Um, that said, I have shared some materials with them um, from my own program that was grounded in multi-literacies concepts, um, and it will be interesting to see what they do with that. But what you're talking about here is like traditionally all the assessments or tests have been done a certain way, and then people are questioning, can we change these, right? Because that's the one of the hardest things to change in the department. So yeah, it's the way students are being tested. I mean, right. it's easier for when you say to an instructor, could you try teaching it this way, or could you approach the text this way, you know? Right. But that is always the hardest thing, is to change the assessment. Yeah, and I mean, because there, this was not done from a backward design way, it, it sort of ended up being a bigger problem, I think, than they anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the issues that came up a lot when we were talking to instructors and attending meetings was, well, the texts that they read are on the exams, but it's all factual information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if that's all they're being tested on, then what difference does it make if we do a deeper dive into the text? Kind of thing? I mean, that's not the way that people articulated it, but that was the crux of it. The other thing was that you know students have to take the the proficiency test. What is it? The LP. LP. Uh, the LP. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a, a great concern about proficiency development because students have to be able to take that test. The, the interesting thing, though, is that in my mind, at least, I don't see proficiency development and the multiliteracies approach as being compatible in any way. Um, so I think that's some more professional development work that needs to take place and maybe something that will come out in the materials that we develop for the, the Carla Literacies website is how can a multiliteracies approach contribute to proficiency development? But, but yeah, the whole assessment thing was kind of fraught. Um, I, I think there's been yeah. a couple pilot classes, right, where they're trying to smooth the connection between mm -hmm. um, the text that they're using and, and the, how they're using it and the assessment. I don't know if that means that they've um, changed the assessment at all, but they're trying to make it a smoother. Oh, okay, okay. yeah, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, just a couple of classes that they're piloting. Okay. Yeah. So that's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. 
I wonder if you could go back to the slide with the three circles. Yeah, so you liked the graphics so much. I did. <laughs> <laughs> and the color. <laughs> I just wondered if you guys wouldn't mind talking a little bit more about the, so the student affect. There was a little bit about teacher affect. So, it, are, do you see those as unrelated, or I would just say incompatible with the CLT and multi literacies? Or maybe you could speak more to how that would play in, or or if it doesn't, I don't know. I, I just found that. So the reason that we highlighted these is because they were cases, at least with the community language teaching ones, where the way that the participants talked about student affect, for them it was incompatible. With the exception of case three, it was incompatible with... Wait, what am I trying to say? Uh, that... Sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. I'm trying to make sure that I answer this properly. So. The, yeah, that creating a classroom that fosters positive student affect was something that was important for proficiency development, for being able to speak freely in the classroom, and that that somehow was incompatible with the purpose of a multi-literacies approach that was looking at text. And so I, I don't feel that way myself, but that was what the participants were pointing out. The exception to that was case three, who felt that affect was something that provided entree into deeper textual analysis, because once students were comfortable, then they would be willing to take more risks doing textual analysis. The other thing related to student affect was that participants were very concerned that adopting a multiliteracies approach was creating a more teacher-focused classroom. This came out across multiple participants, and that that also um, had a negative impact on student affect. Because the classroom is supposed to be collaborative, and students are supposed to be driving what's happening, and they're supposed to be talking about their opinions, and, and that the participants felt like they had to be in front of the room leading <coughs> the activities. And so that was also part of it being student affect, creating positive student affect, being opposition. Did I answer the question? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Could you expand more on some of those like sticking points that came up, like the idea that um, the texts are not comprehensible, or that like multiliteracies is too teacher centered? Like, what other kinds of sticking points came out of the interviews? I'm just curious. In terms of in terms of, I guess, how teachers were understanding multiliteracies and what it looks like. Like, what I, kind of some of the misconceptions? I guess. Yeah, I think the other sticking point, and that's related to language forms. The other big sticking point was that. Um, it was difficult for participants to see that teaching through text with a multiliteracies approach was a way of also teaching language forms. Mm -hmm. So this, this difficulty in understanding the idea of making four meaning connections through text was very um, difficult for, for, for people to grasp. And that's a common thing that comes up in the research on teacher learning related to multiliteracies pedagogy. It came up in, this, in the materials analysis study that we did in terms of the types of activities that have been designed. It's come up in the work that Heather Allen and Beatrice Dupree have done on this. So that was the other big thing that came up. I was just going to say that what you, the last thing you said right before Lauren's question was really striking to me, that teachers would see a multi literacies approach as being so much more teacher-driven, and that to me that reflects then a very traditional perspective of what analyzing a text means, yes. and that they weren't getting that sociocultural yes. approach to to looking at yes. text. And that did come out. And the other thing was that, yeah, that the idea that the teacher has to explain things. And that there's one right way to analyze the text. Yeah, so there the were, teacher would that explain what didn't come out for everybody, that did come out for one of the participants. But this idea that you kind of have to lead students to an, to an interpretation, even if it is a more individual understanding of the text, that it's the teacher's responsibility to lead there. And the thing that was that's kind of dicey about that is that we tried to tease this out in the interviews. Was it really about the approach that was the problem, or was it the actual design of the activities? And if we redesigned the activities, would it still be too teacher-centered? And that was hard for the participants to answer. They hadn't designed the materials themselves, so they were teaching you know, with materials that somebody else had designed. So that was kind of a problem, too. Um, 
so we, we didn't really, it was hard to get at sort of a fine grain understanding of that concern. Yeah. Had they ever, um, had they seen models of how to do it? I think some of them have observed colleagues teaching. Yes. And they had been working, there were multiple um, lessons in the course that were text oriented. Yeah. And this particular one had been created by um, somebody else, but then they all worked collaboratively to modify it based mm -hmm. upon their experiences with it. So there was some buy-in in terms of um, having created some of the activities. Um, yeah. There, yeah. Yeah, the observation thing is another, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult, I think it's a difficult thing to ask of people working in a multi-section program where they're teaching three classes a semester and um, you don't want to infringe on their time too much. So. Do you have any sense of um, how these understandings played out in class? Did it, do you feel like their understandings of CLT versus multiliteracies played out in the same way that they came out in the interview data? Does, you know what I'm we haven't looked at that data yet, okay. so I can't answer that question. Okay. Yeah, we have a lot of data. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, what we're going to be looking at next is conceptual understanding. We were trying to avoid talking about conceptual understanding in this and really just how are they talking about it, not what their understandings are, but it gets a little muddy. Um, and then eventually we will be looking at the classroom data. We haven't had a chance to dive into that. You know, when I, as I'm listening, a lot of this multiliteracies framework and some of the issues related with it remind me of content-based yes. language oh, yeah. teaching. And I think about, um, you know, in terms of working with teachers and how challenging it is to um, clarify and help them understand the integration of the language and content piece. Yep. So I guess my question is, is how how developed is that within the multiliteracies framework? And then I guess related, what kind of connections do you see between multiliteracies and content based? So how thinking? developed is is this notion of, of integrating, you know, because we keep teachers I think tend to see things kind of either or, you know, yeah, 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 right? Yeah. So how developed is the yeah. how to integrate the language piece so that you're yeah. not in this conundrum of I'm here and not there? Yeah, so it's actually like the crux of the approach is integrating language and text. So the, the, the goal of multiliteracies pedagogy is to engage students in meaning design, which is essentially establishing form meaning connections through text. And there's a particular activity type called um, conceptualizing that focuses on identifying language features and connecting those features to overall textual meaning. Um, so it's, it's pretty overt, but it's conceptually very abstract, I think, for teachers. Um, and so when we did our materials analysis, we found that often the conceptualizing activities were like, okay, now we're going to do a mini grammar lesson. And then I'm going to use ideas or vocabulary from the text to give my examples of the grammar, which is not language and content integration, right? Um, and it's, yeah, it's a problem in the CBI research on teacher development. It's a problem in the multiliteracies research on teacher development. Um, in terms of commonalities, I don't feel comfortable answering that question because I um, don't know CBI well enough to be able to answer the question intelligently, I'm afraid I would say something inaccurate. But one of the things that we want to do with the Literacies Project is to create some kind of a graphic organizer that differentiates CBI and multiliteracies and, and um, other text-based approaches so that teachers can see how they're similar and how they're different. So maybe some kind of event that I remember. I don't know what, but yeah. So that's coming. I just don't want to misspeak since I'm being recorded. <laughs> Anything else? I just want to comment on something as I was listening to you present. One of the ideas that I really liked was this idea of inviting teachers to take 
a concept that they're familiar with, like comprehensibility, I think was the idea you suggested, and then really helping them understand how that concept yes. would you know, be tweaked, but still there. Yes. I just thought that was such a powerful idea, and I think it's something that, that would be really helpful for teachers. Yeah, and I think it's something that we can integrate into the literacy project for Carla. Yeah, I, I like that one too. We were excited when we kind of came up with that. Yeah, I having tried to anyway. Um, I want to follow up on that and say that I think that's great because I think that the biggest biggest problem is this fear idea and this idea like what I've been doing it wrong for ten years. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and and this total deflation and sense of of loss of identity is, is huge. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even the concept like student affect that we were talking about before, I mean, that's not a concept that's um, owned by communicative language teaching, <laughs> right? So what does it mean to develop positive student affect in a multiliteracy classroom? I think it means the same thing as it does in a communicative language teaching classroom. It's just maybe less focused on self and more focused on the relationship of the self to the outside world, right? But um, but yeah, elucidating those concepts from a multiliteracy's perspective I think could be really useful. Yeah. Kate, I remember when we did the summer workshop on authentic text, we actually spent a lot of time talking about things that we normally did and how we could still use them and see them through a new lens. Yes. And, and that actually happened at that workshop. How many people were in there? Like 50 20, people? 25? seemed like more. 50. <laughs> let's, just, let's just raise the number. No one will notice. Twice as many. But anyhow, we spent a lot of time because there were people who had taught a couple of years, people like yeah. me taught forever, and we talked about how we wanted to feel comfortable with new concepts, but we didn't want to abandon. Yeah. And then you spent time saying, well, that's a good activity because that will work with what we're learning. So that was really important, I thought. Yeah, and I don't yeah. think there's any reason. I'm not trying to argue that communicative language teaching has no purpose. Yeah. I'm not trying to argue that at all. Mm -hmm. um, so, but how do we incorporate this or multiliteracies so that students can have a richer experience with the content that they're learning about. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.